I'm Angela Kelly Robeck, host of the Empowered Principal Podcast, a part of the Education Podcast Network, just like the show you're listening to now. Shows on the network are individually owned and opinions expressed may not reflect others. Find other education podcasts at edupodcastnetwork.com. Teaching While Queer is a podcast for 2S LGBTQ plus educational professionals to share their experiences in academia. Hi, I'm your host, Brian Stanton, a theater pedagogue and educator in New York City. And my goal is to share stories from around the world from 2S LGBTQ plus educators. I hope you enjoy Teaching While Queer. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Teaching While Queer. I am your host, Brian Stanton. Today, I'm so excited to have joining me a science teacher, Aaron Rupchan Kukatek. Hi, Aaron. How are you doing? Hello. I'm doing pretty well today. Thank you so much for having me on. Oh, it's my pleasure. Glad to be here. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, how do you identify within the community? I've already mentioned you're a science teacher. Where do you teach? Sure. So um, as you said, I am a science teacher. This is I'm about to start my eighth year in the classroom teaching science. Um, I work primarily right now. I work with middle school, but I've also worked with high school in the past. Um, I generally use he, him and his, um, although in some queer spaces, I'll use she, her and hers because that just feels like praxis. Um, And I generally identify as a gay slash queer man. Awesome. And so in teaching middle school science, do you cover like all the bases or do you choose, like, do you have a uh, specific biology or, or whatnot that you cover? Gotcha. I should have said that earlier. Um, I specifically teach earth science. So we focus a bit on space, geology. Um, there's a little more math in it than I think some of my kids like or expect, but we try to have fun along the way. Awesome. And so let's go back on a journey in time and Tell us a little bit about your life as a queer student. Sure. So I mm, don't remember particularly identifying as a queer student until maybe late middle school, early high school. Um, I went to small private schools, particularly Jewish schools, uh, conservative Jewish day school in the Salman Schechter system on the East Coast for, yeah, through high school. Um, So there weren't really many models of queerness or um, frankly even mentions of queerness so I was never quite sure of what that was or what it could be with the exception that it was kind of bad you know labeled in the zeitgeist and also it felt to some degree um, the school culture and even some of the things we taught in the classroom were like that's a bad thing that's not a thing we do Um, so it very much either wasn't spoken about or when it was, was spoken of in a negative instead of a positive. Um, so that was unfortunately how I, st- <laughs> where my queer awakening started it was like, oh, oh no, this is, this is not ideal for where I am. What's interesting to me is that you hear that a lot when it comes to the Christian religion. And so mm-hmm. for me, this is uh, maybe the first time I'm hearing someone who comes from the Jewish religion who um, is experiencing queerness as something that's bad that we don't don't do that, um, and so how do you think that kind of informs who you are as a teacher now? Oh man, um, uh, I think back to a specific um, uh, speaker that someone brought in. I think it was one of the um, physical education teachers. Um, you know, this was. 2004, 2005. So like before we did as much work in education as we do today on sort of recognizing students and emotional support, um, she brought in a speaker, I think his name was Scott Freed, um, who like came to us and spoke about his experience as a a gay man with AIDS and like what that was like for him and living with HIV and like how he was treated and how he um, was made to understand the world. And he's a motivational speaker, at least was at the time. Um, and so for me to just see that was like, oh my goodness, like this, this is a grown up, like he's, he's doing okay. And so for me, I think um, a lot of the work that I hope I'm able to do, at least for my students to say, hey, like, here's a grown up who's been through maybe some of the stuff that I've gone through, you know, maybe not quite the same, because, um, you know, they're, of 
course, in a very different stage of development than I am. But, you know, they have that moment of saying, hey, these things happen to other people too, and they can get through it, you know, and seem to be more or less whole. Yeah, I have to agree with that. I, as a young person who was growing up in the late 90s, uh, or coming of age in the late 90s, I had this experience of just not realizing that there could be a queer future um, hmm. because there were there were no examples of it. And I think in retrospect, I can look back now and find clear, queer influences and queer people that were in my life that I just didn't know were mm -hmm. queer, like my mom's hairstylist. You know, um, that gentleman was a very queer man, but like... I was a young kid and did not realize um, that that's who he was, namely because it wasn't okay to be out um, and there were no like out examples of what queerness looks like as an adult. I used to joke, not really joke, but like for a long time I didn't see myself, my life after high school because for me there was no life for queer people. It just didn't exist. Mm -hmm. And so it's interesting right. now to be married with children um, because that was an impossibility. It was a future that didn't exist. And it's so, um, I don't know, um, surreal, I guess, to be living a yeah. future that never existed in my childhood. And I, I think part of that also is just sort of the... Um the content and the things that we're able to speak to children about. I think there's a much wider field right now, particularly because there's a lot uh, more focus on gender and identity and expression. Um, whereas when I was younger, I remember very much being like, you know, you're um, either lesbian or you're gay or you're bisexual, or you want to go from one, one quote unquote, air quotes, gender to another. Whereas now we're really opening a larger conversation and you know, frankly, it's a more appropriate conversation for me to have with an 11 year old. Mm -hmm. Like that's, I'm not going to talk to an 11 year old about, you know, I, I don't have things to talk to them about sex ed. That's not my job. That's not my training, but like we can talk about gender. How does this make you feel about you and your body, like who you are in your body? We can talk about that. That's totally workable. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's so interesting because I just finished reading a book called Rainbow Parenting by Linz uh, hmm. Immer. And uh, they talk about the fact that, like, uh, so many people get caught up in sexuality and think intercourse. Mm -hmm. And quite literally, yeah. none of us, not even people who teach sex education, none of us want to talk to children about <laughs> intercourse. What we're saying <laughs> nope. is that, like, gender is almost, it's the love for yourself and who you are. And then sexuality is who you love. And mm. so it's a, it's a focus on love versus like the physical act of intercourse, which so many people get caught up on. And I think you're, you're right there and saying like, I'm not going to have a conversation with these 11 year olds about sex, but I can talk to you about being comfortable expressing yourself and uh, being respectful of other people when they're expressing themselves and who they are. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that you're right on par with where really society needs to be. But there's a large group that still focuses on the fact that like homosexuality is sex and heterosexuality is sex. And it's all about sex and sex equals intercourse when really that's not the conversation we're having here. It's just word association. Right. No one, I, <laughs> even as a, you know, someone who's taught bio to like seniors and juniors, like, no, I don't like listing all the parts to these people, but like that part I will do. That's, I will use the terms and we will get through it. Yep. Um, and you just teach it on basic science and biology. Yep. Yep. I, I do have a prepared rant that I do like to give some of my students on some of the scale pictures, but that's, that's for another podcast. You have a prepared rant because of the scale of the pictures that show up in textbooks? I, I do. It's just the scales, are they're just wrong. It's just They should show parts side by side. There's no scale. It just, it's, it's just bad for everyone. I have so many thoughts, but that's, that's another thing. I was actually just talking to my husband yesterday. We were talking about real estate, but about how pictures mm. don't really have scale. 
And no, so, like, and they they should. I went to see a property that he uh, that we are buying, and it was my first time seeing it. And the pictures make it look bigger than it is, and I was like, oh, always. And and that's a wise euphemism, I suppose. But like pictures, yeah, pictures the real do not estate. have scale. Yep. No, they need scale. It's it's helpful. They shouldn't be side by side if they're not the same size. It just doesn't make sense. Absolutely. I also get it, uh, I don't know, I find intriguing just how things are drawn, because even Mm. they're trying to show anatomy, things don't hang that way in real life when they're showing pictures of genitals, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, So Right, there's this one version. mm -hmm. Science books are so helpful and also have their problems, right? Right, and And also. And also. (laughs) We were talking briefly at the start of the episode, Mm -hmm. and this kind of touches on the conversation about culture and connecting with students, um, in that when I was learning how to pronounce your name, you had informed me that you are um, one of those folks who uh, either uses a nickname or abbreviation. A lot of my Mm -hmm. students call me Stanton because I have a, as a theater teacher, I surprisingly have a lot of uh, athletes. And so, like, that's okay, a very wonderful. athletic thing, right? To call people mm-hmm. by their last name. Um, but there's conversations. It's the start of the school year here in Texas right now. And there are conversations flying around the internet about take the time to learn your student's name, which I 100% agree with. And as I am engaging in those conversations, I'm getting a lot of people saying, okay, so what do we do for the students who are like, you can call me whatever, or. Uh, just call me an initial or here's a an anglo-saxon nickname that makes things easier for everyone that they've just become Hmm. accustomed to people not being able to pronounce their names so do you mind talking on that a little bit sure i have i have so many thoughts (laughs) um i guess one thing i should say is um where i currently teach now i teach in um san francisco um i work in a place where a number of teachers also go by um one or two letter names. So some of them it's first name, some of them it's last name, but for whatever reason, they've chosen to use one or two letters for their name. So that's that was already in the culture of the school when I came in. Um, I have a long last name, even longer since I became married. Um, and so my original last name um, uh, is, I believe it's Czech in origin. And I have maybe heard one or two people in my life, pronounce it correctly off the bat the first time. And that's even after going to the Czech Republic. Like it's it's not an easy name to pronounce. Um, and so when my name got twice as long, it felt, I mean, we're, we're going right into that topic you said, like it felt easier, right? To just automatically shorten it to some degree. Um, and I also agree strongly with, as you said, that we do need to learn our students' names and we do need to learn um, how to pronounce their names properly. Um, for me, what it, where it feels, the spot that I've come to, I think, is, um, you know, at the start of the year, I have however many students I have, I am very open with them about that I'm gonna essentially make them wear name tags for about three weeks so I can learn their names. Um, even though the school I'm is, that I work in now is not very large, it's hard for me to learn names. Um, I can only imagine some of them might also have that difficulty, right? They're all learning all of their class and all of their teachers. Whereas we teachers are like, oh yeah, you're, I know you, I've known you for years. I even know your uh, family friendly beverage of choice at that cafe we go to on Fridays. <laughs> like, you know, I, I know these people. Um, and so for me, it does just feel like it's a little more accessible to say like, hey, you know, here's my full name on the board. I'm going to tell you how to pronounce it. But you're doing a lot right now. If you want to just go with RK, we can just do that. And that's that's a fine place to be. Absolutely. And I think what's really key there is just like... Mm-hmm. You go through the process of teaching the name. You go through the process of learning the name. And then just as you would with um, any student, like call them what they prefer to be called. So Mm -hmm. if they really are like, I don't know, for some reason wanting Marcos to be Mark, 
then you mm-hmm. call the mark um, and you just yeah. respect their choices. But at the same time, you take the time to learn how to say their names. I had a, a yep. student who had a beautiful name, uh, Jitanjali, and I I spent mm. s- a couple weeks learning to say her name correctly because one, it's beautiful, and two, yeah, I didn't want to be one of those people who just said, "Oh well, I I don't know how I'm never gonna be able to pronounce that." Like it's it's right. just it's words and names. Mm-hmm. Names are super important. Um, and like that dovetailed into, you know, a great relationship with her parents and whatnot, because I took this effort and this time, um, Mm. to connect and like really get to know, um, her through calling her who she is. Um, Mm -hmm. so fully respect that. And also I'm in the same, you know, same boat. Like if you want to call me Stanton, you can call me Mr. Stanton. You can call me Mr. S like, yeah. Do what you need to do. And there's so many teachers who are like that, right? Like, just call me Miss G. Like, my best friend is just Miss G. Her last name's Guerrero, but she's just Miss G. Everybody knows her as Miss G. So, mm-hmm. um, I think there's so much value in taking the time to connect with someone, but also, like, respecting that, one, people are going through a lot. Students are going through a lot, especially at the start of class. So, if you want to call me RK, perfect. You're do- right. You've got a lot going on. Um, Mm -hmm. and two, you know, learning. Yeah. I do tell them though, not my first name, (laughs) like (laughs) never call me by my first name. We're not there. Um, I have to think about how I'm going to work, word my, uh, we're not friends conversation better with the students because some of them just like, oh, he doesn't like us. I'm like, oh, that's okay. We're, so I got to reword it. We'll get there. I totally, when I went into my first year teaching, um, I had two fold things happening. I really like held on to the classes I had to take to become a parent through the foster care system where it was mm-hmm. like, be stern and strict with your rules, like keep mm-hmm. barriers. And so I had students who were like, we really didn't feel like we got to know you until three quarters of the way through the school year. And I was wow. like, well, I didn't mean that. And it's not to say that I don't care about you. It's that I don't care about your drama. Um, because we te- I'm teaching <laughs> theater. And if we start focusing mm-hmm. on our personal dramas, then we're not going to get to the drama we're trying to put on stage. Um, and so then right. I got better at communicating that right the next year. And then I had another thing happening where I was like, sure, you know, I heard the students calling the principal by the first name and he like, you know, wanted everybody to either call him doctor or or you know first name or whatever and so i was like sure call me brian and that lasted two weeks before (laughs) i was like nah that doesn't feel right yeah Yeah. i mean uh, with that being said i have worked at a quaker school before so first names was like the thing to do there but also that there were a lot of very different things about that school compared to everywhere else i've worked since so that's that's really neat that's really interesting um I want to talk a little bit about, you know, I have a lot of respect for middle school teachers because middle school is a wild time. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I appreciate you for doing what you do. And I don't know how you do it. Um, In fact, I just interviewed for a position where I might be teaching eighth grade and high school. And so I'm like, what am I going to do with those eighth graders? (laughs) That's an interesting range. All right. (laughs) And so um, I just wanted to see like how do you see yourself in in middle school do you see yourself working with a lot of queer students um oh this one's a a yes but use an improv game it's kind of uh um i do and this is so this is something i've been um struggling a bit in the past two years at my current school um because i do work in the gsa i'm one of the gsa chairs or maybe officially the GSA chair, um, because we don't have a lot of students who come to GSA, our Gender and Sexuality Alliance. Um, And I don't think it's necessarily because they, um, uh, because there aren't, there isn't a population of queer students. I think there certainly is, right? Like if I ask the students, they know who they are. They know who is around. Um, I can tell you, for example, I bought a bunch of uh, pride flags specifically for my GSA 
um, just to be like, hey, everyone, and we're starting the year. Everyone gets a flag that you can either keep in your in your locker, keep wherever, fine. Um, but the entire grade, this entire sixth grade, went rabid for them. We were like, <laughs> yes, we all want them. And I, I don't mean to imply that I think the entire sixth grade is queer per se. Like, wow, that would, wow, that, that, that breaks would the wild. proportions. <laughs> yeah, but like that enough of them were like, huh, this is a great flag, and I'd love to have one. Um, and that the queer kids who you know, kept it personally in a place where it meant something to them. We're like, yeah, I'm going to take one. And everyone else also wants, like, it is a good, like, admirable slash good. I don't know. I don't know what the terms the kids are using these days. Um, but like, that is a positive thing to identify X, Y, or Z. Yeah. Um, and so, like, yes, there are a number of kids who, like, you know, I've gleaned one way or another are queer um, that I've seen coming in. Um, but they don't necessarily express that to me. Um, and I'm not saying I like, uh, what's, uh, I, I do a riff with some of my colleagues on, um, you know, that horrible stereotype that we're like looking for kids, these like awful things people say. And I'm like, we don't, what, what's the phrase? I, Groom. It's like, we don't look, but we we scout. Like we look out for like, see who might be like needing something for, for us or from us. Um, and so, you know, I see students who are, I, I know, they're talking in the little clique that I'm like, oh, everyone else in that clique is one of the queer kids. Hmm, I wonder like what they're dealing with. They're like, they seemed really excited about such and so show that goes against stereotypes of what someone might have thought. Huh, are they really got into this role doing this or that? It's like, huh, okay. Like not saying anything, not approaching, just like, okay, I'm, ready to support, like bracing myself if they need or want or express something. I love that. I think uh, it's so interesting because there's so much pushback right now on like people thinking that we're looking and trying to like pull kids into queerness when really we're looking out exactly. You no. We're scouting <laughs> out for those students who need help. Those right. students who might identify but not feel safe in other spaces or mm-hmm. whatnot. And so... It's so interesting because it's like there's so many things going around right now about social media and media and just like how transness or queerness being portrayed in the media is going to turn Mm -hmm. people gay. And I'm just sitting here thinking like I consumed literally only heterosexual media my entire (laughs) life up until an adult, like up until I was an adult. And... Mm -hmm still turned out queer like right if it was really that influential we would see far less queer people than we do right and uh i I should say as a caveat also like you know um i very clearly was just mentioning like oh i'm like looking out for 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 different stereotypes and this and that the other thing and there are any number of times where i'm just straight up wrong yeah you know i (laughs) that's why i'm not approaching a kid being like i saw you wearing that turtleneck you a little, you know, stuff, like, I'm not doing that. I'm just like, okay, like, things to keep in mind. If they bring it up to me, I'll be like, okay, wonderful. Like, I'm ready to help. I love that. I saw you wearing that turtleneck. Are you a little in Olympus? Yeah, right. Like, mm. <laughs> I, saw that, I saw that yearbook picture. You looked great. But like, I'm not. <laughs> right. And I think that's the thing is it's not about approaching other people. It's about being approachable. Mm-hmm. So that yeah. if someone needs to come to you for something that they feel confident and comfortable doing so. How do you see, like, I've heard stories about how wild middle school can be. Do you see a lot of anti-queer behavior in middle school? I mean, you're in San Francisco, um, so that might be a little bit different because, you know, hmm. at least for a while, and, and, and possibly still so, it is considered like a, a gay center. Um, mm-hmm. so you might not see it as much as say other spaces, but there are a lot of wild things happening right now in California. Um, yeah. and as a person who, you know, grew up there, I'm like looking back at my state going, Oh my gosh, what is happening? Um, I thankfully have not, um, I've not seen anything against like my students in particular, um, uh, either in school or out of school. Um, I do know it's something we are. Uh, kind of thinking about and nervous about. Um, uh, I'm thinking, I guess, particularly about a situation we have. 
not a situation is too strong a word, um, but there is a, um, where is it? It's an episode on Netflix about the gender binary by um, John Van Ness, um, where they sort of talk about, you know, a few examples of um, what different binaries of gender mean. Um, they meet a few people who are non-binary or trans, and they talk about their experiences with gender. Um, overall, I think it's very sweet. There's like a handful of swears, which gets my sixth graders very excited. <laughs> um, but I had originally just planned to just show it to the kids, let them see it. Um, and one of my administrators was, you know, she, uh, she was nervous about this. She was like, wait, like, I wanted to at least tell the parents first so that, you know, the parents will know what's happening. Um, and, you know, at the time I, I balked a little bit. I was like, whoa, like, why? Why do we need to tell the parents what this is about? Um, but, you know, as I sat with it and I thought about it and I spoke with her afterwards, it was just like, okay, this is really sort of a, a CYA, you know, we're making sure that we're okay. If anything happens that we're all in agreement about, hey, we were gonna show this to the kids. It's sanctioned, we agreed on it. It is what it is. If, if you don't like it, I'm sorry you didn't like it, but we we here agreed that we are gonna do this. I, I, I actually kind of appreciate that step. I know it seems like a lot of um, paperwork and I had this struggle mm -hmm. as a yeah. theater teacher because theater is being censored nationwide all over the place. Right. And I've had situations where, like, the previous directors who were all cisgender white folks um, mm -hmm. could do whatever they want. Like, literally could <laughs> do whatever they want. I heard stories about, like, they did a production where a student flips off an audience member and one night the principal was in that seat. You know, and Ooh. like I've heard about a student who they they were doing a show where they faked smoking weed on stage, like really mm -hmm. can do whatever they want. But as soon as I came into the role, things started to get questioned. Like my mm. my morality was questioned, and I literally had to answer a question about whether or not I would put sex on the stage. And I was like, oh my gosh, these kids are like my kids. I always say that <laughs> right. I have four children plus 150 others. Like, mm -hmm. I would not want to see my children having sex on stage. So why would I want to see yours? Like, right. that's just so gross to me. But the question came because of this idea that, like, in conservative communities, queer people are just innately immoral. Mm, sure. There was, a, <laughs> there was a conversation I was having with the uh, theater teacher at my school right now where we were just sort of joking about, you know, making a short list of plays that you can never do in a middle school that like sometimes you're still in high school and you're like, I, I, I wish you hadn't done that. The, those dancers are 14. I, we didn't need that. <laughs> yeah. I've seen like Chicago's happening in my community and I'm yeah. like, mm -hmm. nope. No, thank you. Like, I don't, yeah. don't want to go see, and some of the students had like transferred because it's the performing arts school in the, in the city. And so like, by all means, they're the performing arts school. So they can do a little bit more pushing of the box and, and, sure. and whatnot. But like some of those kids transferred from my school and I was like, nope, I do not want to see you dancing around in a leotard. I look back at my high school experience and we did damn Yankees and uh, we did crazy for you which are all like i don't know pretty misogynistic musicals in a sense it's like mm -hmm. the, these men can do whatever they want and like the mm -hmm. women just have to deal with it kind of thing um but some of the costumes that these girls had to wear were literally like unitards with feathers and unitards with nothing at some points it was just unitards and i'm like why were we okay with this? Right. And to the same point, like now I see like plays where all of a sudden the men in the play are all, or young men in the play are like all shirtless and whatnot. And so it's interesting to me that there's this like push about queer people sexualizing students but i almost guarantee that if you go to a queer director versus a heterosexual cisgender director of a theater program you're gonna mm -hmm. find the more risque things happening on the other side because we will immediately be targeted 
as, right. as being immoral. Mm -hmm. And so like in your instance, the, the way I see it different from the forms and whatnot I had to fill out, it was that I don't think they came to it from a question of immorality, but it's like a way of saying mm -hmm. that they've got your back. Like, yeah, for we sure. want the parents to know that you didn't just make a decision on your own and that th this is you pushing the quote unquote queer agenda. It's right. that we talked about this. We agreed mm -hmm. on this information being sent out and that if people have a problem with it, they go directly to the administrators. They don't have to come to you because it wasn't you. For sure. You know? And I think that, that, that in that instance is so helpful because a lot of times it's hard to know whether or not your administration is going to have your back, especially nowadays. Right. And so have you had instances where your administrators had to like step in because of who you are or anything that came up? I mean, teaching earth science might be a little bit yeah. easier to manage without something controversial popping into the, the, you know, the curriculum or the conversation. Um, not particularly related to school. Um, I did make the mistake of uh, once having part of my socials unlocked and I said something in the big wide world and some people took very unkindly to it and found where I work, frankly. Uh, and so I had to have a talk with like my, yeah, basically I had to like find my HR people at work and be like, hey, here's what happened. You know, I've shut down all my accounts. I've deleted the original thing. I'm like blocking and reporting things right and left. Um, they don't seem like quality, frankly, quality humans at this point. I, <laughs> they're not acting in any sort of good faith. Um, here's all those things that I've done. And my HR and admin, thankfully, it was a few jobs back for like, that sounds terrible. We got you. Like we, you know, we, <laughs> we hired you for reasons and we trust those reasons and we trust we trust you like that's that's part of it we're not going to listen to some randos on the internet i was like thank you so much <laughs> i love that i had an uh, issue in the first season of this show where i had interviewed a couple and they came on and some conservative folks from their community found the podcast and started going after their jobs and their administrators at the district level, the high school level, listened to the episode and were like, this is a fantastic episode. I ended up taking it down because I wanted to take the heat off of them, but it is so frustrating to me that literally people will spend hours of their day trying to ruin someone's life because you made a statement online. So thinking about authenticity and whatnot, we've talked about mm -hmm. like showing up for students when it comes to name and whatnot. How or rather, what advice would you give to a new queer teacher who's headed into the classroom who's kind of unsure about how to authentically show up as themselves in the classroom? Gotcha. Um, this is something I struggle with myself. And as I said, I've been in the classroom for, what, seven years now? Um, I think that we as teachers, and I guess specifically as queer teachers, right, we're trying very much to be... Uh, visible, like visible where we can show students, show up for students and for ourselves to some degree, right, of, you know, our full gender presentations and our full um, gender expression as much as we can. Um, but I know at least for me, like, you know, for example, the outfit that I wear at Pride or at certain events that I go to that makes me feel like very euphoric and feel very great can't wear that at 8 a.m. on a Tuesday. Like, I, that's not, that's not going to fly with these young people. Um, and so I think, and you know, that it also doesn't feel for me that like I'm tamping something down that I'm not wearing that when I come to work. I, I come to peace with that. Um, but one thing that I will say that is important is to try to find spots that feel uh, mm, Visible enough just does sounds too small, but that's all, I'm, all I can come up with. But like things that show that you're there, that you're present, you know, that you are also one of their teachers and you're a queer person, right? I'm thankful that I'm able to be at a school where like, I have a picture of my husband on my desk. I bring him up. I mention him now and again. I have a progress pride flag on my desk. 
Do the students always remember that it's there? No, sometimes they're surprised that I'm married or have a husband. And I will gesture and say, it's been there <laughs> since you started in August. Um, but, you know, finding things like that, if not, if not even for the students, like it can just be for yourself first of like, hey, I like this figurine because this figurine means X to me from like this weekend I went to it, this thing, I, like, you know, it doesn't even have to be a rainbow covered thing. It helps the students a bit if it is, but like if you just need to do something for you, great, put that figurine on the corner. And if they ask why it's there, you can share or not. I love that. I was speaking with educators years ago about this, but like, I don't know if I would be as out as I am now if I weren't a married person. Like that's that changes the game, that changes the conversation because, you know, that fits a certain mold of adults of a certain age like oh like you may be queer but you're married so like you're not one of the ones we're quote unquote worried about so i want to wrap up on um my portion of interviewing and then this season you'll have the opportunity to ask me a question but for my final question for you is mm -hmm. thinking ahead what can schools and that includes the school community parents teachers administrators mm -hmm. community members what can they do to create a more inclusive environment for LGBTQ students? Um, all right, I guess I have two answers. One is structural and one I think is cultural. Because um, I, as a teacher, have come up occasionally with um, structural barriers to students wanting specifically to change names and or pronouns. Um, so specifically, and I, I want to be clear, I'm talking about like in-house, like I'm not talking about forms that are going home or communication with parents per se, but like, what can we do in-house to um, validate and affirm those identities? Um, so I guess the first thing I'm thinking is like, can we change, if they have a school email, can we change that school email at least internally so that there's a version that like, we know we can send something to and like, it'll go to the same inbox, great. Or is there a way that we can all agree on, you know, whatever grade keeping software we use or on paper, we all use the same thing. That I think would go a long way towards making a lot of kids really happy because oftentimes it's a really simple fix. You know, I'll, I'll try to go to Adam, they're like, that sounds so hard. But then I'll talk to our IT person like, yeah, give me like three minutes. I wish you had asked me in September, it's March now. And I'm like, oh, easy, got this. Um, so that's one thing. And the second is, um, I think we worry a lot and like, you know, we're teachers, we kind of worry a lot. It's kind of what we do. Um, but we worry a lot about getting, uh, like all of this right, you know, and like high school and middle school and even elementary to a degree also are like, they're messy times. Mm -hmm. Like these 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 people are making little messes because they're they're kind of little messes and like that's okay but like what i'm trying to, so wherever we can give them space to be like okay like you know what try on that gender identity try on that other like fine you know what we don't necessarily have to have like a three week a three excuse me three week process where we you know bring in all of the parents and the guidance counselor and all of the teachers and have a meeting in triplet it's like okay great, that student wants to use some pronouns you haven't heard. Try it, and if, you know, let them try it. And if you honestly, as a person, are struggling, say, hey, I'm trying, I'm working on it, I want to meet you where you are, Be, give me a little grace. I'm like, I think, I think it'll make our lives and their lives a little bit easier. Absolutely. And I think that's where there's, like, troublesome laws that are coming into play mm. where like if a student requests to use different pronouns you have to immediately inform the parents and i'm like oh, i yeah. feel like oh. that needs to be a bigger conversation because sometimes the mm -hmm. student just does need to try it on and right. see if it fits because right. maybe it's it not won't. always serious yeah mm -hmm. and 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 maybe it does fit and, yeah. and things will have to change but those bigger conversations shouldn't have to be driven by school administrators because quite literally 
who's in danger by saying mm-hmm. these pronouns. Like no right. one is in danger by doing that unless the school environment is such that that student gets put in physical danger just by being out about who they are. But right. we're in this place where like counselors are supposed to be able to keep some things to themselves right unless the child Mm -hmm. is in danger or is going to put someone else in danger right we got that mandated reporter status that's that's part of what we do and so it's just i think disrespectful to children to be like Mm -hmm. you don't have the capacity to make that choice for yourself when quite literally who knows it could just be a passing thing but it also could be who this person is they're not going to know unless someone supports them and then maybe like a lack of support is going to make things 20 times worse because that seems to be Mm -hmm. the experience right right so i think you're you're spot on with that i also think that what you were saying about structures is so important because like i've had experience where rosters have messed me up Like I Mm -hmm. I happened to look at the school roster and I said the wrong name and I was like, I literally don't ever use that name. Like you've never told me that name. Like you didn't tell me that name, but it's Mm -hmm. on the roster and it got stuck in my head or, or teaching in a digital world where you're doing everything on Google classroom and having students be like, I don't know who this person is because the name is not right. And, Mm -hmm. and that gets so frustrating because that is really an easy fix. I mean, if you've ever changed a name or email address on Google, (laughs) it takes a matter of seconds, um, Mm -hmm. especially display names, like at minimum, great. Keep the email address, whatever you want to keep the email address at minimum display name can be changed in a second. And right, that's easy. not a legally binding thing. Google Classroom is not a nope. legally binding thing. So why can't we do or Canvas or whatever your school is using? Yeah, whatever the platform. Yeah. So I think those things systemically need to be changed because that yeah. really is like, I honestly feel like the Department of Education t- should take a stance on that and contact all these companies and just be like, you need to find a quick solution for if someone needs to have a different name so that the legal documents mm-hmm. have the legal name and the non-legal documents don't. Right. So I think you're absolutely correct. At this point now, though, you get to ask me a question. So I'm going to turn the table and let you take it away. Okay. Um, where do you find... Um, your queerness affirmed in your teaching practice? Um, so I'll give a very specific example uh, because I think it's, um, it's interesting and it was a journey that I took with my students. Um, mm. When I first started going by he, they pronouns, I was a solo teacher just teaching theater on my own and I hadn't built a culture where I believed that yes, ma'am, yes, sir, were, like, important phrases. And that's Mm -hmm. because, one, like, I grew up in Southern California, and it is innately a South thing to to say, like, yes, ma'am, yes, sir. Like, it's really built into the culture down here. And so when I moved to Texas, I noticed that my kids started, like, my personal children were doing a lot more yes, ma'am, yes, sir. But, like, I didn't work it into my program. When I moved to a new school, the culture of the program was yes, ma'am, yes, sir. But my students, Mm -hmm. knowing that my program, my pronouns were he, they asked me one day, like, what do you want us to say? Like, is it yes, sir? And I was Hmm. like, it's, it's really not. And yes, ma'am doesn't sound right either. Like we need to find an honorific that is kind of more non-binary affirming. Mm -hmm. And my students came up with I, I captain, um, (laughs) because anybody can be a captain. It's pretty gender Mm -hmm. neutral but it's also a sign of respect um for somebody who's in a leadership position so that is the gender neutral affirming um response that we created for yes ma'am yes sir and worked it into the culture so that when 
I was giving instruction, the response was aye aye captain. And when my partner was giving instruction, the response was yes ma'am. And I think that for me, just that little bit of like classroom management respect really like did a number to change my interaction with students because one, they were able to follow through with the same kind of culture that was built by the director. And two, um, they got to see what it means for a non-binary person to have a euphoric honorific. Hmm. So I think that that is super fun and it was completely unexpected, but it also comes down to like a lot of the times I, I jokingly say, are you ready kids? Um, and so (laughs) it's that lead into South park, right? I, I captain, I do it with my Mm -hmm. own, my own kids whenever we leave the house. And so, um, I just work that kind of goofiness into something that actually turned out to be really meaningful to me. And we'll see if I'm able to keep it and include it in, in future programs because I am moving out of state and Mm -hmm. yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Is definitely like very Texas. Yeah. Um, So if we get into situations where my students are like, yes, sir, then we get to have that conversation again. Be like, actually, Mm. I would prefer that you say something like "Aye, aye, captain, because one, it's a little bit more fun. And two, it's, um, it's more gender neutral. Yeah. Well, Aaron, I want to thank you so much for being on the podcast today. I really enjoyed our conversation. Um, and I, I just love a lot of what you've said. And I think we came up with a lot of things today just through talking that haven't been addressed Mm. in the podcast. And so I think that's super cool for everybody who's listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast and I hope you all have an amazing day. Goodbye. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Teaching While Queer. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, make sure to subscribe wherever you listen to your favorite podcast. Leave a review, and that would help out tremendously. You can also support the podcast by going to www.teachingwhilequeer.com and hit support the show. Thanks so much, and have a great day.